All right, Hannah Rose, LCPC licensed clinical professional counselor. Welcome to Green Pill. First question, will you take the green pill? Yes, what is in the pill? Your green pill is a world just like the red pill, but the green pill is a world where everyone cares about their health. We're all thriving or okay. And society prioritizes mental, physical, and emotional health. Yes, sign me up for all of that. Mm -hmm. And it also just makes you feel good when you take it. A little green high. Hannah's background is really cool, Rose Wellness. She started in the addiction world and uh, graduated from JHU, John Hopkins. She's based in Maryland, so is Rose Wellness. They've got 13 therapists running the gamut from EMDR through uh, traditional talk therapy and some other modalities that you'll hear about. She's an adjunct professor. She's a writer for a few different websites. This will be a good one today. Hannah, how did you get into into helping people with their brains and their psychology? Why'd you do that? Mm. What a question. It all began now. I think going through my own personal life struggles just as a human always geared me towards wanting to know more about what's going on under the surface. And I have a very vivid memory of being 18 years old, a counselor at a sleepaway summer camp, and I was the lacrosse specialist. And with the teenagers, we would just say, okay, we're not playing lacrosse today. We're going to do lacrosse therapy, which I was not licensed to do. And we would each throw the ball to each other and just talk about what was really going on or what was going on at home and so this draw to just facilitate counseling or group counseling it's just it's been in me for a long time it just felt right and what did you do professionally or non-professionally what did you do to make money before you became a counselor or what did you do from 18 till then Oof. I had all sorts of jobs. Mainly through school, I worked in restaurants, so I was a mm -hmm. server. I'm mm -hmm. the worst server, just the worst. I just, I was so anxious about making sure everyone got what they needed, and there's only so much you can control as a server. I was a camp <laughs> counselor during the summers. I was a bar mitzvah dancer, like one of those motivators that is, come on kids, in your awkward 13-year-old stage, <laughs> let's do the chest slide. Mm -hmm. I really just did anything I could to make ends meet. <laughs> So you're making ends meet. And then when did you go to your, when did you go to graduate school? Uh, when was yeah, that, so that decision instant after undergrad? How did that work? No, I, I majored in psychology at Goucher College in Maryland. And I took a year off and worked at Texas Roadhouse and realized I got to go back to school. This, <laughs> I cannot do this long term. Again, not a great server. And then I applied to graduate schools and... When I got into Hopkins, I was stunned and was like, I, I should go here. And so I just followed that path. And so when you got the acceptance to Hopkins, you were psyched because you're working at Texas Roadhouse and you probably you were a great server in the sense that you were engaging and you probably therapized a lot of people, but probably the food came late, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, it's the worst. I still wake up from nightmares of getting double or triple set or forgetting someone's order. And I'm like, <gasps> it's very stressful. I give so much credit to servers. That's a hard job. Another hard job is running a business. And now you went and we'll get there. Like you're running this wellness business, but you seem very relaxed about it. What caught your interest? Like when you went to Johns Hopkins, were you like, all right, I'm going to work on addiction. I'm going to work in the addiction world. What drew you to therapy in what subjects in therapy and what people, yeah. which people? Great questions. So I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I didn't know what kind of mode that would take on. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I wanted to pursue a PhD or a PsyD, get a master's, social work, counseling. And so I just applied to a bunch of places. Mm -hmm. And I only really got my master's in clinical mental health counseling because that was the program that Hopkins offered. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the name going to the school that is known for being a good school would serve me, which I think it did. But I definitely, I said from the jump, I never wanted to do addiction work. I'm in recovery myself. I got sober in a 12 step program when I was 20. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't want to do addiction counseling. That's cliche. That's also too close to home. And I ended up doing addiction counseling just because I was placed during my practicum and internship at an outpatient rehab. And I fell in love with it. I really did. And I continued with that for about five years. And so you were in recovery since you were 20. And so you went to school after you were 20, right, for your master's. And so you always said you wouldn't be the addictions counselor. You became it. And may I ask you, what was tough in your childhood that did you did you fall into addiction? Did you do just say, did you fall in? Was it chemical? Was it lifestyle based? Tell me the story of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's actually really it's pretty common misconception that like something had to have happened or I know people who had the most functional 
boundaried, mm-hmm. loving families, and still it's there's no, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter always. And so for me, great family, grew up, cared for, loved, nurtured. And for me, it was just a love affair with alcohol. From the very first time I drank, I react bodily and mentally different than my fellows. That's what separates alcoholics and non-alcoholics, where when you start drinking, there's something called a phenomenon of craving and you just wanna keep drinking. Now, when you're between 15 and 20, and probably a little older as well, most people drink to get drunk. We don't just enjoy Mm -hmm. a fine glass of wine with a steak, that's not a thing, in high Mm -hmm. school and in college. And so I couldn't really piece that my drinking was that different than my peers, Mm -hmm. except I started to experience consequences, physical consequences, emotional consequences of my drinking, ostracizing relationships, basically being Mm -hmm. like spiritually and emotionally dead inside. Mm -hmm. And you don't, it's also a misconception that you have to hit some kind of rock bottom to get sober. I believe rock bottom is when you stop digging. And I was in a musical at my college at the time and had another giant mishap from my drinking and there was suicidality. My parents wanted to take me out of school and I just... I really didn't want to leave this play. (laughs) And I was like, I'll get sober. And I didn't stay sober that time, but it it introduced me to this 12-step fellowship. And six months later, I ended up actually getting sober the night before my senior year of college started. Wow. So college, so you did the party, college, drinking, but you were also probably a pretty good student. You were partying throughout college, doing the normal thing, but for you, alcohol just disrupted your life more than it does for most college students or? Yeah, for sure. And again, like those two things that separate an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic or an alcoholic and a problem drinker or a binge drinker or a college student is this phenomenon of craving. And Mm -hmm. I don't know where the night's going to go and it doesn't matter what happens or how awful it is, I will continue to drink. And so there's this level of powerlessness and takes a lot of human or not human intervention to get me to stop. And I was just, I was in so much pain and desperate enough to do anything. And I said, all right, I I gotta do something about this. And I didn't expect to stay sober, but what I found in this, in the 12 steps is really friends and young people and a whole world I didn't know about. And I attribute so much of how I am and who I am now to the last 12 years of being in recovery. Mm -hmm. And for you it wasn't boring to be in recovery it wasn't like a loss you actually found a whole new world 1000 percent. i thought my life was over i grieved alcohol partying my life my identity someone Mm -hmm. said to me what's hannah rose without alcohol i'll never forget that (laughs) i was like oh right to the heart (laughs) that was my identity and yeah i thought my life was over and i would just be boring and depressed forever and that is so not the case at all it was difficult at first but done some pretty cool stuff and anyone that knows me knows i'm very enthusiastic about life and having fun and when people say if you don't drink what do you do it's Mm -hmm. it's a really simple answer it's everything else else. literally everything else a million infinity minus one thing and so when you got clean if i'm using the nomenclature correctly you, you got sober what did you spend your time doing at night? So I was still living in my college dorm room on campus mm-hmm. at Goucher. And so I just went to a lot of 12 step meetings. I, we like went bowling and went to the diner every night. The friends I made threw me a 21st birthday party, like at a club, <laughs> never had a legal drink. And mm-hmm. it really, yeah, it was just that fellowship of people was really helpful, especially at first. Cause I was like, what do I do? Ah. But I was also in college. So I was trying to scrape together my grades. Cause I really didn't do well in school cause it wasn't a priority to me. So senior year, when you got clean, that's when you turned it on with school a little bit, enough so that you got into John Hopkins later. Yeah, I, uh, John Hopkins didn't require a standardized test, and I think that made a difference. And they also did a group interview, and I don't think I looked very good on paper. I had no extracurriculars. My grades were pretty awful, Um, but I think I showed up as myself and passionate and excited, and I was very Mm -hmm. candid, and I think they saw probably what I couldn't see yet, which Mm -hmm. was like I, I could grow into someone that had something to offer. So you did um, a few years following in in all kinds of recovery centers. And what made you start Rose Wellness like on the side? Yeah, so it was 2019 and I had been working at a 28 day inpatient substance use rehab Mm -hmm. for maybe four and a half years. And I just, I was so burnt out. Classic signs of burnout. I was emotionally raw. I, I felt compassion fatigue. Working in 
the addiction world and being in recovery myself, there's so much death. There's so much death, both amongst peers and then patients. And you are, it truly is life and death every single day of work. And it's not, wow. it's not like a metaphor. It's no, this is life and death. Like when someone would complete their 28 day stay, I didn't know they were going to die. And it, I, I took so much responsibility on, even though as a counselor, you can't be responsible for people who stay sober or people who relapse or people who die. We could just provide the tools and whatever they do with the tools is on them, which is a very humbling lesson to learn. And so in 2019, I decided I would dip my toe in private practice and just myself, maybe see some people privately on in the evenings and on weekends. And within four months, I had a full caseload and a wait list, and I decided to take that leap. And it was one of the scariest things I ever have done because I didn't, I had so much imposter syndrome and fear mm. and I didn't know if I had clinical acumen outside of relying on my own addiction experience and mm. being an, an addictions counselor. So much of it was just based on what I had learned in my own recovery. Mm -hmm. And even though I got my master's in counseling, I had so much fear when a non-alcoholic comes to therapy mm -hmm. to deal with other stuff, do I have the tools? And I took that leap and it was amazing. And this is pre COVID. And mm -hmm. then COVID happened and more people sought therapy. The demand just increased tenfold. And I got so sick of saying, I don't have availability or I'm on a wait list. I, I loathe mm -hmm. wait lists because sure. when someone has that window of willingness to go to therapy, it's really important for the clinician to act on it, even if that means refer them elsewhere. And so in 2021, I decided to just maybe take on a therapist or two and rebrand as Rose Wellness. We have merch, yay. It's like such mm -hmm. a, I just was excited to make merch, honestly. That was and, number um, one. Yeah, and that's how the group practice was formed. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I won't take away from what I've learned and say I still have no idea what I'm doing, but it's very learn as you go, make mistakes, figure it out. And it's not nearly as difficult as I thought it would be. I'm the least stressed I've ever been in my life. Yeah, I want to unpack a few things you said, but that's probably the most interesting one for me when I met you because we got on a call and you said, oh yeah, I've got these people working for me. Everything's going great. And other people are just, and I think I'm probably looking in the mirror, would be like, all right, I got to manage this. I got to make a process chart for this. I got to email this. So how do you say so copacetic and chill managing what seems like a lot? Great question. It hasn't always been that way. I think there's seasons of more stress and fear. It's almost all fear. And for me, so much of my entrepreneurial businessy journey has been asking for help and outsourcing and reading from other practice owners, reading books about a phenomenal book called Radical Candor about leadership and Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I'm about to actually start her eight week training about leadership and I love Brene Brown. And so for me, a lot of it has been absorbing other people's experiences and insights like a sponge and trying to apply as much as I can. And there's this great website called Practice of the Practice. I'm doing a speaking gig for them in yes. a couple of weeks, actually. You've heard and of that just, one. Yeah, there's like an ebook, there's free PDFs, there's so many blog posts about you can't do it all yourself. And even though that control says, I have to do billing, I have to do insurance, I have to manage these contractors, mm -hmm. I have just leaned into. You know, I don't have anything to offer if I'm burnt out. And so how can I take a step back, offload some tasks where possible, keep the things I truly enjoy doing and find ways to build so that I can delegate the things that I hate doing, like insurance and working with managed care. And it's not just been, I feel it's like very opportunistic. I, I feel like a lot has happened very serendipitously where like running Rose Wellness is easier than when I worked full time at an agency and was a counselor mm -hmm. case manager, I went away, we'll just say that for a month earlier this year on this very exciting <laughs> thing that I did that I can't legally talk about yet. And, um, but you can Google it. And I was <laughs> gone. I was in Fiji for a month with no contact with the outside world. And that experience leading up to it really kicked me in the butt to say, I need to make sure Rose Wellness can run itself. Mm -hmm. Right, I can't be running everything because I won't be there for a month. 
And I did. And when I came home, I was expecting it to be like on fire and just like drowning and stuff. And it was, the clinicians were fine. All the insurance <laughs> and the billing was fine. Clients were fine. And I was like, oh my God, like that's, I feel like a proud parent, like this thing mm -hmm. that I accidentally created can take care of itself. And so I'm here for support, but I am not in the day to day. I'm not micromanaging. I'm not like trying to control all these things. And so I'm always looking at how to pull back. And that has been really amazing. So self-education, which sounds like a big piece. So it wasn't just this landed on your lap and then you said, oh, I'm going to just let it run. It was a lot of deliberate knowledge seeking or mentorship seeking, whether formal, informal, through a book, through a talk and two outsourcing, right? So it, both overseas and just to others. So giving up responsibility and trust. So there's a lot of trust there and maybe you're naturally trusting or maybe you just have good people. You, you gave me it for people not watching on videos. I do think there's something in a sense, two, two pieces I would pull out and they're related. There's a deadline here. I hear. So with Fiji, you had a deadline. You set everything up towards that deadline. You're freaking out a little bit. When you came back, it was good. But if you didn't have that deadline, there might have been less work done. And then similarly and concurrently in the past, you started getting more clients and you couldn't really handle it unless you outsourced. That's what I'm hearing. How do you manage your own wellness, Hannah, day to day? Like, what do you like to do? What do you not like to do, but you still do? And how do you counsel patients in that, yeah, in that regard? So I'm a really big fan of everything that the, the idea or the notion that like everything we're looking for is inside of us already. And it's my task to figure out what's blocking me. Mm. And if I can identify those blocks and then remove them, it just increases my quality of life. There's a great quote by the Persian poet Rumi. And it says, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you've built against it. <laughs> Can you hear my dog barking? Hey, Ralph. Can you not? Stop it, Ralph. Yeah, Ralph. Ralph, Ralph come so, on. Oh God. So for me, a lot of it has been therapy, right? Good therapy. My recovery mm -hmm. is huge. These are like the foundational pieces. Okay. I love reading. And so for me, really being mindful of the media that I'm taking in. Like I don't have Instagram. I've had it in the past, but it's just a stress anxiety ball for me. So I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. I haven't had social media for the majority of the last almost four years since COVID. I recently reactivated Facebook, but like being mindful of what drains from my cup, like what takes my cup or makes it empty and what pours into it and then making intentional choices around that. So I read a ton, I mm -hmm. like physically read and listen to books. And mm -hmm. instead of only listening to or reading nonfiction, informative, educational things, like I love reading fantasy, just like trash, smutty fantasy. I'm like, <laughs> yes, this is the best. And then I listen to nonfiction and I go back and forth listening to something that's really educational and profound versus listening to a domestic thriller because it's entertaining and I'm like, yes, this is great. And so for me, it's moderating what media I take in. It's m movement. Movement has become huge. What do you do really around movement? COVID. Hmm. I've gone through different phases of things. I was very into yoga for a very long time. During COVID, I, I did get a Peloton and it has changed my life. Like I'm in that cult following. Like Love it. it changed my life and it's not just cycling they have strength and stretching and meditation pilates bar yoga just like i i want to be a brand ambassador i'm just like please i'm you obsessed with you all but you might it's have to turn social life. media back on yeah oh i, I won't do that <laughs> okay but it's changed my life and so i try to get out of the house every day you know spend time with my dog ralph spend time with friends my fiance it's the first time i've ever said that i'm always like my boyfriend my partner That's <laughs> i know the feeling fiance. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to clip that and amplify it three times. Amazing. <laughs> so you've got these support systems from mental, so therapy plus what you love, which is information consumption and, and syn synchronizing that information. You've got some physical practice. You've got your recovery. You've got your friends, your fiance. You've got Ralph. So it sounds like you're well supported in a lot of ways. And you mentioned that your childhood was well supported as well. And you, you took to recovery and AA really felt right for you. And so a lot of things clicked and it seems like you're attentive to your own needs. 
When you're counseling patients around a holistic lifestyle, mm. what what are the wins you've seen recently? What, what trends are you seeing? And what are the difficulties you're seeing when you talk about these subjects? So I will say that as of this week, I'm actually transitioning out the last of my clients, mm -hmm. which is very bittersweet. And I'm have fully stepped into more of a mm -hmm. administrative role. So it's so weird. I'm like not, I'm a therapist at heart, but I'm not really a therapist anymore. However, mm -hmm. what I've seen is, and I'm so biased. Nope, okay. we're gonna wait. Ralph, sir. I'm sure I have a package. I'm sure that's what it is. <laughs> hey, Ralph. Maybe if I close this door, you won't be able to hear it. You probably will though, because I'm in a town house. Can All you right. still hear him? So with clients, I'm definitely, I try to be conscientious of my own bias with social media because I know it can be such a tool and a mm -hmm. gateway to connection. I have seen so much misinformation about mental health on social media. I see endless scrolling, which can, and, and multitasking, which our brains can't actually do. And so there's this attention stuff going on. Many people have ADHD, many people do not. It's just the lifestyle of mm -hmm. scrolling while paying attention to other things. And so one barrier to wellness that I have seen, not across the board, but it can be um, our relationship with our phones. And mm -hmm. I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology by any means, but I read a book a few years ago called How to Break Up With Your Phone by Catherine mm. Price. And I'm, it's my most watched video on YouTube is me talking about that book, which is interesting. Because I'll I link think, it. yeah, how to break up with your phone. And then I also read Digital Minimalism, a different book, book. And like, yep. oh, and so to me, I just, I see that as in Catherine Price's book, she says, what do you want to pay attention to? And becoming mm -hmm. more conscious of a very unconscious or mindless thing we do where, and you can pick up your phone right now and open the screen time part of the settings mm -hmm. app and look at how many times you just pick it up a day and it's alarming. When I was teaching at Goucher, my poor students, I gave them an extra credit assignment where they would track their screen time and if they could bring it down by a certain percentage, they would get extra credit in the class. And oh for God. some of them, even just being mindful of how often they were using their phones, how many hours they spent on Instagram and TikTok was mind blowing because we don't even know. So I try not to push my but that media, is your yeah. soapbox. That is one of your soapboxes. I know. Have, I have know. you heard? Have you heard of One Sec app where it makes you take a deep breath? So it's called One Sec, and it, you install it on your phone. You target it to Instagram or Facebook or your, even your email. And every time you go to open Instagram or whichever, it goes take a deep inhale, take a deep exhale. So it delays the gratification by about five seconds, and then it asks you, "Are you sure you still want to open this app?" So my consumption of Instagram was at like. 30 minutes and now it's down to five and then when you do go into the app you have to tell it like are you anxious are you procrastinating are you doing it for work like for me sometimes it's work wow so it really delays that i don't know if it's the scientifically correct way but the dopamine hit so definitely recommend that one for those out there listening okay so one soapbox is phone time and i'm totally with you on that what else what other challenges do you see to overall wellness and what other wins are you seeing come out there or have you seen Here's my soapbox on my slash Brene Brown, but my view on what keeps most of us feeling stuck is shame and shame narratives. Mm. And so just quick overview. If guilt is I feel badly about this, shame is I am bad. It's like taking guilt, swallowing it whole, internalizing it. I hear these narratives often, oh, that's just who I am. This is just what I do. And it's these very finite narratives. Anything that's I am bad at or I am blank, enough. I'm not blank enough, etc. It's this culture of scarcity and it's shame keeps us stuck. And the first article I ever wrote that was, I think it was in the Baltimore Sun and like the Denver Post, like it got picked up, which was surprising, but it was called, you can't shame yourself into growth. Cause I think a lot of us are of that mentality. Oh my God, I'm such a piece of blank. I need to try harder. And that's not actually how we grow through things. Really, it's self-compassion, self-forgiveness, radical self-forgiveness. And so I have seen so many wins with 
clients tapping into their relationship with themselves. And that's what I branded myself as therapy wise was like, this is what I specialize in is really getting into and unpacking the relationship we have with ourselves because from that, everything else stems and looking at what blocks us from self-love. And it's usually one of two things. One is we genuinely don't like ourselves. We've got a lot of shame narratives. We have a lot like that's usually one. However, more common than that is that we've been conditioned by society or our parents or messages in the media that self-love is narcissism and is egotistical. And so to be proud of yourself or really like certain things about yourself, we've almost conditioned ourselves to shove that down because it's like, I don't want to come across as cocky and kind of honing in on which one is it for you. And then let's unpack that further. I think guiding clients towards their own truth and being able to get in touch with their gut and this kind of like compass that can guide us. That's the win is seeing clients really just wipe away and remove all these things that have blocked them from that. They already know what's good for them. They already know in their gut. One of the YouTube videos is called like questions to ask yourself if you're questioning your relationship or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that I had a therapist say this to me once. If you say, I don't know enough times, like you do know, you just mm-hmm. don't want that to be the answer. And mm-hmm. I was, like, yeah. So I love, I just love seeing the resilience of the human spirit. And some of my clients have gone through hell, trauma, hell, and to see them get through it, like against all odds really, and see them pick themselves up like the therapist isn't doing that for them Mm -hmm. and when they try to offload responsibility and say you did this and i'm like no i didn't you allowed (laughs) me to be a part of this but i've just watched you've done (laughs) all the work right like 50 minutes of therapy once a week is not where the growth happens it's Mm -hmm. every other minute of every other day totally the same for coaching to a personal trainer one hour a week but then the person loses 20 pounds it's all their behaviors everywhere else and just real quick on shame because i know it's, you love to talk about it, as you told me i'm glad you brought it up sometimes we think about shame as this like really dark thing that we're hiding like something we're hiding about ourselves that we are and we're hiding it because we don't want anybody to see it but what you're saying is first of all you might not be that and second you should just accept it if you are and radical acceptance and maybe even broadcast of it get tattoos or post it on social media and then you quickly segued from shame to like self-manifestation to listening to the inner voice and a lot of therapists talk about relationships with others interpersonal not intrapersonal and you're talking about here number one and everything flows from there how do you link those two from shame to then like radical self-love but also self-accountability I don't want to ask too complicated of a question, but how do you bridge the two from shame, which seems so dark to then just focusing on your own relationship? Yeah, I think great, again, great questions. I think understanding shame is first and foremost, and I would love to be able to package this process and be like, just do these four things. Yes, Um, do it. However, (laughs) if I were to boil it down, it would say first is the awareness. It's the mindfulness. What are my shame narratives? I am blank. Write down every shame narrative that you can think of. Mm -hmm. I am not skinny enough. I'm not successful enough. I am bad at relationships. I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm bad at boundaries. Mm -hmm. No, you have a pattern of not setting boundaries for really specific reasons that probably served you at a certain point in your life as survival, and now it no longer serves you. It's not, we are not finite. Our whole human experience is so fluid. When people say you can't teach a new dog, an old dog new tricks, I'm just like, oh, it really grinds my gears because like <laughs> you can. I don't know about dogs, but like humans, you can. And it's never too late. So identify shame. And if you are able to process with a therapist, get in there with them. There's so much good stuff too outside of therapy. Like in 2015, that's when I started reading my first Brene Brown book, which was Daring Greatly. And it was about shame, fear, and vulnerability. And it changed my whole life. Because I was feeling, like I said, imposter syndrome. I was feeling like, oh, I'm four years sober. I shouldn't be experiencing this pain. I should have it all together. I'm this Mm. age. I should figure it all out. Those shoulds are so damaging. Are those shoulds shame? 
they can be a manifestation of shame because cool. I should cool. be further along in my life is I am not successful enough or I am a failure, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it can all be branches of shame. So identifying shame, being able to consume and really internalize information about shame. So like for me, Brittany Brown, super helpful. Also processing that shame, finding its roots. I'm a really big fan of EMDR because I'm trained in it, which is a very specific modality for therapy. And it's not just for trauma. That's a misconception. Mm. And so really being able to unpack and process shame and then finding opportunities, even if it's one moment every day to practice radical self-forgiveness or radical acceptance or for me like i do a lot of public speaking and if i'm really nervous and uncomfortable i'll usually start by saying that i'm like i'm so nervous right now like i'm sweaty i'm uncomfortable <laughs> and people usually laugh because it's oh that's the human experience like you're just a person and for me it's let me rip off any mask that i thought i need to put on in order to look a certain way to you mm. and to me the end goal is that this foundation of self can't be rocked by anything externally. So what you think of me is not only none of my business, but what you think of me doesn't make or break my relationship with myself. And if I can live authentically without fear of what y'all think of me, which is such a process, it's so freeing. It's so freeing to the best. And those not seeing on video, she's, it is the best. She's like looking at the ceiling, like this is core to her being. And I think that's an awesome place to wrap it up because people need to take that message home, which is identify the shame, work with an information source, whether it be therapy or a book, process it through something like EMDR, or maybe some other mind altering modality, whether it be meditation, breath work, yoga, exercise, some other ones you can think of. And then my favorite thing about what you said is practice it day to day. When I couldn't talk to people when I was 17, I just had a panicky fear of talking to anybody who was a female gender, but especially pretty much anybody. At some point I read a book and then I said, you know what? I'm just going to start talking to the guy at the cafe, talking to the bus driver, talking to the girl down the street, whatever it was. Every day I practiced and I really like it for shame and I'm going to take a lot away there and i like how you tied shame to these shoulds to these oh i shouldn't be nervous right now going to public speak i shouldn't be sweating no i should keep it all together instead you're like i'm sweating i'm nervous <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and i'm happy to be I here and it, it just comes your energy comes out it's like you don't need to alchemize the like weird feelings inside you just shout them out and therefore they don't control you in a way and you also show people that you don't necessarily care what they think in a respectful way yeah in a respectful way of course i care i'm human but i'm not going to trade my authenticity for your approval i'm gonna be myself and that's not gonna be everyone's cup of tea and one thing you said about habit and practice on a purely neurobiological level that's how we form new neural pathways it's not just like maybe one day it'll become a habit it's like the more that i practice something my brain is quite literally creating a new neural pathway just like a groove from rain on a mountain and mm -hmm. if it continues to rain in the same spot that groove will get deeper and so unlearning habit is so much more difficult than learning new ones mm -hmm. but they go hand in hand and also we're all having this incredibly intense sometimes isolating human experience and connection is the antidote to so much of our shit. Can I swear? Yeah, shit. Okay. Fuck, bitch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so connection is the antidote to the misery that we often feel. We feel alone in it, and we're not alone at all. And also, like, real recognizes real. So if you are yourself and real and authentic, like, people see that and are drawn to that because mm. there's enough bullshitting, and it's just nice, yeah. How do you take someone from, if you don't mind, I'll, I can continue for just a bit. How do you take someone f who's, they're sitting there at the job they don't like, they're pretending, they dress up in the suit every day, they're happy with their partner, their parents think that they're straight edge, but actually they're bi and they go to raves at night, but they didn't tell anybody. You take this person and, by the way, I'm the opposite of that person. I probably could have been that person. And they want to become more authentic, more, this is who I am. So there's a practice, right? But for them, taking the first step feels hard. They feel so far away from that because they're not really showing up as themselves in any part of their life. Mm -hmm. What exercises do you give them to do it? 
and when they're discouraged like how do you re-encourage them or how do they re-encourage themselves yeah great oh, great questions i think in this case and in many cases a lot of it comes from us which is internal family systems and it's therapeutic practice and, and theory modality of parts work so i would get curious with them in counseling and i would encourage them to think about this on their own about the different parts of self so what part of you goes out at night and goes to raves what part of you do you bring to work what part of you are you with your family how old is that part how does that part dress like there's just so many tools for parts work because we all have different parts and we often shame the parts that we think don't serve us and that doesn't get us anywhere <laughs> and again starting with just identifying if someone were to say I feel so far away from my authentic self and I'm not living the life I want to live. I would first acknowledge, you know how huge it is to just say that out loud? Mm -hmm. The fact that you came to therapy willingly and said that, there's a part of you that is willing to own that truth. And it may not have manifested in all areas of your life yet, but let's look at that part. So mm -hmm. like in recovery, when people are like, I really don't want to be sober, I really want to drink, etc. whether it's someone that I sponsor or it's someone like a patient, I'd say, what part of you decided to call me? Like, what part of you willingly came to rehab? Oh, you had an intervention, so it was between this and prison. Why wouldn't you choose prison? Why wouldn't you choose homelessness? Like, you, don't, you didn't have to be here. There's a part of you that has chosen to do that. And if we can bring more attention to that, the part of self that is actually self-protective and healthier than we think, that's huge because it's there. So even when someone's, I'm miserable and I don't like anything about myself and I don't want to be here. It's, Why'd you come? But you're here. Not in a passive aggressive way, but like some part of you that's telling on yourself right now wants to not feel this way. Tell me more about that. Again, a whole lot of steps with that person that's living a very incongruent life with cognitive dissonance, which is like the human experience. And so I'd recommend a lot of books and I would just talk to them about it and piece together where it comes from and why and if it's serving them and the fear it's always usually fear and it's usually fear of how others will react hmm and i think you hit on a big one with the intervention or like these life events that seemingly draw people to finally change the person breaks up the intervention the get fired the script presentation but your girlfriend breaks up with you because you did a bunch of stupid things in the last 60 days or it was just you knew it was coming or it just wasn't meant to be. And the intervention happens because you've been binging and the firing at work happens because you've been probably part of you has been underperforming on purpose to drive that forward. So I like how you take what are seemingly stark, high contrast situations for people and they come in, oh, I don't want to be here. I'm only here because this thing happened or oh, it's been a really rough time. I don't even think this is going to work. But you're like, look at the series of actions or look at just your own actions. You're encouraging. I think your answer to my question is that you're encouraging and you piece out the person and say, like, part of you is doing what you want to do. And the journey might be faster than people think too. And I want to highlight that, like the acceleration and velocity of becoming more congruent. And we're all on the journey, right? Like I'm not going to think I'm anywhere close to congruent, but it might take less time might all happen at once. Hannah Rose, it's been awesome having you on. Thank you. So wide ranging and inspiring. Anything else you want to close with? Tell the world, share a message. Yeah, just why Why is part of me like just being yourself? That is not. Do it. You can, no, no, <laughs> no. Not, do better. It's not that easy. Otherwise, everyone would just be themselves. But what mm. I would say to whoever is listening is you're not alone and all of the things that you might be ashamed of or not like about yourself is what makes you human and what makes you able to connect with everyone else. Imagine if we were all just perfect and had it all together. It'd be so boring. <laughs> You're not alone. Not alone. And you are unique. Thousand percent. Thank you so much. You took the green pill. Great job. Where can people find you? So no social media, right? But uh, the website yeah. is? Tell I us. Have, so my website is rosewellnesscounseling.com. Mm -hmm. And from there are links. There's a whole resources page with some of my favorite, most impactful books. There's also links to, um, there will be a blog page on the website shortly. And it's all the blogs from psychologytoday.com that I've written. And then I have a YouTube channel. And on it, you can see this exciting thing that I'm not allowed to necessarily mm -hmm. talk about, but I can post about it because I put it on my YouTube channel. Boom. I can't wait to find out more about that thing. Thank you so much for coming on. We're going to link all that and we'll talk to you soon.